come here uh, to pour out our praise. We offer you our worship. We offer you our hearts. We offer you our lives, oh Lord. And Father, we want so much in this room today for you to impact us, for you to change us, for you to shake us up out of our slumber, for you to encourage where there needs to be encouragement, for you to correct where there needs to be correction. What we need, Lord, today so much is for you to come and be among us in great power and might. And so I pray, Lord, right now, you would begin to establish in every heart a deep hunger and thirst and desire for you and what you offer us and what you can bring us and the word you have for us today. And so I pray, Lord, I do pray for every single person gathered in this room today. Your precious church assembled, Lord, I pray. You know each one by name. You know the challenges and the hardships. You know the difficulties and the uncertainties. And you know the things that everyone is walking through. You know the joys and the victories as well. And I pray, oh God, that you would just minister, minister to each one in the way that only you can. Father, people haven't gathered here to hear a man. We want to hear from you. We haven't gathered here to listen to some good singing. We want to worship you. And we pray, Lord, that that's what would happen in this room, that that is happening, that continues to happen. So, Lord, in this moment, in the, these brief moments we have together in your word, we ask that you would speak to us. Speak to us, Lord. We are listening. And I just encourage each one in this room right now to just whisper that prayer to the Lord right now. Lord, speak to me. Just speak to me. In your heart. You know what you're walking through. You know if you've been far from him. He loves you. He embraces you. And he, he's calling you today. Just ask him to speak to you. And he will. Father, use this time for your glory, for your namesake, and for your renown and fame in this room, in this city, in our province, in our country, and around the world, we pray. In Jesus' name, we pray. If you agree, say really loud, amen. 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 Before you sit down, just greet the person next to you. I love to give you opportunities to welcome each other. If you see somebody you don't recognize, try to make your way to them. Welcome them. Amen. Well, you can grab a seat. Did you know that one of the most uh, lucrative businesses in North America and even all over the world is the business, <clears throat> excuse me, of counterfeiting? Counterfeiting. I don't know if you've heard of that before. Someone takes a popular brand and they study it, they analyze it, they dissect it, and they dishonestly replicate it and they sell it as if it's the real thing. It's counterfeiting. Purses, shoes, designer coats, clothing of all kinds. Almost every authentic name brand has a counterfeit, a subsequent counterfeit. And it's a problem for big companies because a lot of times people just can't decipher the difference between the real thing and what's fake. I wonder if any ladies in the room are holding a purse. You thought it was the real thing? Maybe not. But it looks good, that's okay. Counterfeiting is a big business. And not only in the business world is counterfeiting a problem. Uh, we see that within the church, within the church, counterfeiting is a problem. It's a problem in the church because the reality is there are thousands and thousands of professing Christians, listen, all over the world that have learned to say the right things, that have learned to go to the right places, that have learned to put on the right facial expressions at just the right time, to stand up at the right time, sit down at the right time, do the right things, go through the motions, but really when their faith is put to the test, their faith is proven to be a facade, it's a fake, it's a counterfeit, it's not the real thing. And the whole thrust of the series we're in, in the book of James, the whole thrust of the book of James is to challenge believers to prove their faith. This will be important for every single one of us. 
We're challenged to prove our faith, to go beyond superficial realities and go towards deep authenticity. I wonder how many in this room today are serious about their relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. I wonder how many in this room today are serious about living out a real, authentic, sincere faith. Because listen, there are a lot of churches full of a lot, a lot, a lot of people that are just not the real thing. They're not the real deal. And James wants us to be the real deal. He wants us to understand that Christianity is not just about what you say and what you say you believe. Christianity and your faith is proven by what you do and how you live and how you behave. James is very concerned that the persecuted Jewish Christians he's writing to understand that true faith, as I said, is not just what you say. It's what you do. True faith is not just what you say you believe. It's how, listen, it's how you act. It's how you act. True faith is not just theoretical, abstract knowledge. It's functional. It's a working reality in our lives. That's true faith. And true faith that resides in the heart always manifests. It always infiltrates. It always dictates what we love and what we think and ultimately how we behave. That's what real faith does. And I wonder, is your faith a real faith? Is it a sincere faith? Or are you just going through the motions? James wants to show us today that real faith is shown and proven in how we live, how we behave, and how we act. If James was here today, standing in this pulpit here in 2016, this is what he'd say to our church. This is what he'd say to the church. He'd say, let's have a little less talking and a lot more doing. That's what James would say. James would say, let's have a little less lips flapping and a lot more hands moving, doing the work of the Lord. Let's get rid of the arrogant, proud, theological arguing and bring in more of the humble, gentle, authentic, theological living. That's what James would say. It doesn't matter what you say. It doesn't matter what you say you believe. Your faith is real when it's shown to be real in how we behave and how we live and how we act. And so we're going to see more and more as we progress through this book. If you really believe in Jesus Christ, listen, if you really believe in Jesus Christ, if you really follow Jesus Christ, then you do what he says. You pick up his book. You devour it. You read it. You meditate on it. You live it. You want it. You thirst for it. You hunger for it. You want to do what he says because Jesus says, if you love me, what do you do? You obey what I command. Remember when Jesus said that? Remember thousands of people were surrounding him and he looked around. He knew some of them wanted a miracle. Some of them wanted food. Some of them wanted different things. Some of them wanted a, a place in his kingdom. They thought it was an earthly kingdom. Jesus looks at thousands of people and he says, listen, listen, listen. If you really love me, if you really love me, do what I say. Obey my commands. And his commands were hard. His commands were difficult. In many occasions caused many hundreds and thousands of people to walk away from Jesus saying, the Bible tells us this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? But if you're ready this morning to be real, and if you're ready to get practical with the word of God, I want you to turn with me right now in your, in your Bibles to the book of James. James chapter 1. And we're going to expound verses 19 to 20. Two verses today. James chapter 1, verses 19 to 20. If you don't have a Bible, you can slip up your hand. And one of the ushers would love to get a copy to you. If you don't own a Bible, that Bible will be our gift to you. Please take it home and read it and have your life uh, changed by the precious word of God. James chapter 1. And the title of the message is Real Faith. Listen, specifically when I speak and act. Real faith when I speak and when I act. James chapter 1, 19 to 20. And this is what James says. He says this. Know this, my beloved brothers. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. Verse 20 says, for the anger of man does not produce 
the righteousness of God. That's it. That's where we're going to be this morning. I'll read it again. He says, Know this, my beloved brothers. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. There are two verses with many, many precious truths for us today. And if you're ready to get real, you're going to embrace these truths with all your heart. This is where we're going to start this morning. Write this down. We show that our faith is real. How? How do we show it? We show that our faith is real and growing when we learn, write this down, to speak and act with real wisdom. When we learn to speak and act with real wisdom. Now, there are at least three things we need to see about the context of verses 19 and 20 before we begin to unpack it. The first thing is this. These verses are a transition between James's emphasis on trials in verses 1 to 18 and his emphasis on receiving and responding to the word of God in the next subsequent verses. We're going to spend our time there in the weeks to come. So it is a transition, these two verses. Secondly, these verses are not only a transition in the text, these verses are also an introduction to a very important theme that will come up later in chapter 3. In chapter 3, James will talk a lot about what it looks like to manage our tongues and how we speak. And if our tongue is out of control, there's a deep problem. He's introducing that theme right here. And then thirdly, James is drawing on both traditional and Jewish literature, also biblical wisdom literature, to communicate something his recipients clearly needed to see, specifically, specifically this, how to speak and act with wisdom. He's drawing on Jewish Wisdom literature, he's drawing on biblical wisdom literature. That's what's impacting him. That's what's influencing him. That's the backdrop of this letter, the backdrop of his writings, as well, along with the teaching of Jesus Christ, to communicate to us how we must speak and act, and it must be with wisdom if we have real faith. So now notice verse 19. Notice verse 19. It says this, Know this, my beloved Brothers, We're going to stop there for a second. Other translations say, take note of this. This is an imperative. It's a call to pay attention. It marks an important transition and shift in subject. And this will be the basis for James' next exhortations. Not only that we are to obey the word of God, but also to be doers of the word of God. That's what he's going to go on to talk about. We're going to get there in the next weeks to come. He's about to highlight that real faith is marked by obedience to the word of God. And in verses 19 to 20, he gives us an example of it. He gives us an example of real faith, obedient to the word of God. What does it look like? Well, it looks like this. We are people who are quick to listen. We are people who are slow to speak. We are people who are slow to anger. He begins to show us here that real faith is displayed, listen, through wise speaking and wise acting and living. You can't just walk through this life thinking like it doesn't matter how you live. You're in this place today and you call yourself a believer in Jesus Christ? Good. I pray that it's real. But the way you show it, the way that you know it's sincere is that your speech and your life is impacted. Otherwise, there may be a problem. Now, right away, we need to see that these verses are very, very, very applicable to us. Verses 19 to 20 are very, very applicable to us. Why? Why? Because wisdom is lacking in the church, and church people speak and behave foolishly sometimes. This is important. It's applicable to us because wisdom is often lacking in marriages and spouses behave foolishly sometimes with one another. You need wisdom. Because wisdom is lacking in friendships and, and friends speak and behave foolishly with one another sometimes. This is so applicable to us. Because wisdom may be lacking in your life and in mine this morning. And the way we speak and behave as Christians may not be reflecting authentic, sincere, and real faith in Jesus Christ. It matters the way we speak. It matters the way we live. It matters the way we behave. And not just because it shows people a good testimony of Christ, 
But it actually shows us, if we examine our hearts, how real this thing is for me. How serious am I about this risen Savior we talked about last week? How serious am I about this faith? Is it real? Is it authentic? Is it sincere? Sincere faith and real faith is seen in the way that we act and the way that we speak. So write this down now. Speaking and acting with real wisdom means that we must be, write this down, we must be quick to listen and slow to speak. Quick to listen and slow to speak. Notice verse 19, it says this. Know this, my beloved brothers. Let every person be quick to hear and slow to speak. This is important for us, and I trust the Lord will use it in our church and in our lives this morning. Sin has so corrupted the human heart, and every single human being on the face of the earth, listen, has a natural inclination to want to be quick to speak and slow to listen. We all have a natural inc inclination because sin has corrupted the human heart, and even Christians who are walking through this process of sancti sanctification, we have an inclination to, we want to speak first and listen later. Why? Because we also have an inclination towards self-justification and self-righteousness and self-exaltation. The human heart always wants to justify itself and exalt itself and wants to speak so that it can justify itself and exalt itself and say something that will contribute to those things. Yet scripture shows us, in fact, that when we seek to justify ourselves, when we seek to show ourselves to be righteous, when we seek to exalt ourselves, the result is a life of, listen, folly. It's foolish. It's foolishness. Notice on the screen for you, Proverbs 18, verse 13 says this. If one gives an answer before he hears... It is his folly and shame. If one gives an answer before he hears, it is his folly and shame. Why? Why? Write these things down now. To speak before listening. Write this down. To speak before listening is foolish because it reveals, it reveals pride. To speak before listening is foolish because it reveals pride. And it's a heart that says, I know everything. It's what the heart thinks that speaks quickly before listening. Because I know everything. The number one threat to real wisdom in our lives is pride. Pride says, I know everything. Pride says, I understand everything. Pride says, I don't care what you have to say. Pride says, I only care about what I have to say. Pride says, I know everything. I want to talk. I want to speak. I don't want to hear what you have to say right now because I know everything. That's what pride says. And pride will be the number one threat to wisdom in our lives. On the screen for you again, Proverbs 11, verse 2, it says this. When pride comes, then comes disgrace. But with the humble is wisdom. But with the humble, it's with wisdom. With, with the one who is quick to listen, there is humility and wisdom. With the one who is slow to speak, there is humility and wisdom. But the one who is quick to speak and slow to listen, there is pride because they only want to hear themselves. They only want others to hear them speak. And the failure to listen before speaking is always a product of pride. It comes from a heart that says, I know everything and therefore I don't need to know what anyone else has to say. And the pride... The pride that refuses to listen is destructive. The pride that refuses to listen is exasperating. The pride that refuses to listen is frustrating. The pride that refuses to listen is fruitless. The pride that refuses to listen is, the scripture says, foolish. It's foolish. That's why James here in his epistle of wisdom, this is what he'd be saying. He'd be saying, hey, listen up, listen up. You can memorize all of Psalms and Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. You can do that. But if you're not quick to listen and slow to speak, you don't know anything about wisdom. 
You, know, you can lead a multi-million dollar organization with hundreds of employees under your direction, but if you don't know what it means to be quick to listen and slow to speak, you know nothing about wisdom. Nothing. You may have a reputation for being a problem solver, resourceful, brilliant, but if you're not quick to listen and slow to speak, you know nothing about wisdom. In fact, if you're quick to speak and slow to listen, you only display foolishness and folly. And James is very concerned that his readers understand that real, authentic faith is seen in the way that we speak and act, in the way that we speak and act in the way that we speak and act when no one else is around. You think it's okay just because it's you and your wife and no one else hears, but you're being foolish just you and your wife? No, that's a problem. You say, no, no, I'm not doing it with a lot of people. I'm not gossiping. No, no, it's a problem. If you're not quick to listen and you're not slow to speak, it's a problem no matter what context you're in. So show me a seasoned, mature, humble believer who loves Jesus with all your heart, and I'll show you someone who is quick to listen and slow to speak. Come on, you know these people. You know these seasoned, mature believers in Jesus Christ. Sometimes they're older in their age, and you watch them, and, and maybe you're in a room with them, and you, everyone wants to hear what they have to say, but they're slow to speak and quick to listen. But show me an impulsive believer. Show me a believer that is quick to speak. Show me a believer that always has an answer quickly without even thinking it through, without even listening to all the prospects. And I'll show you someone who is very immature in their faith. Someone who does not understand fully what it means to speak and act with wisdom. And James is very concerned that we speak and act with wisdom. And if you're in this room today and you're impulsive and you're loose lipped and you just speak and you just run off your mouth and you don't even listen to all the prospects and what everyone else has to say and it's just coming out and it's just coming out and you can't even hardly stop yourself and listen, listen, listen. That's a problem James wants to highlight right now. He says God wants you to re reflect real faith in that you would be acting and speaking with Wisdom, real faith is demonstrated in the humility of not needing to be heard all the time, but in an eagerness to listen first, to listen lovingly, and to listen carefully. That's what wise people do. That's what strong believers do. That's what mature, seasoned believers do. They listen, and they think, and they process and they pray and they express humility. But to speak before listening is foolish because it reveals pride in the heart that says, I know everything. But secondly, write this down. To speak before listening is foolish because not only reveals pride, write this down. To speak before listening is foolish because it reveals ignorance. I won't know as much as I think I know. It reveals ignorance. The proud heart that refuses to listen before speaking is also the heart that refuses to learn. Refuses to learn. Because a faithful listener is a fruitful learner. A faithful listener is a fruitful learner. But people who don't listen, they don't learn anything. People that don't listen, they just talk and they talk and they talk. And that's pride, pride, pride. But people that are quick to listen, they are humbling themselves because they want to hear, because they want to learn, and they want to grow, and they don't want to be ignorant. But speaking before listening is foolish because it reveals ignorance. A failure to listen opens wide the door of misinformation. A failure to listen opens wide the door to miscommunication. A failure to listen opens wide the door to misunderstanding. A failure to listen opens wide the door to ignorance. You think you have all the information you need, but you can't possibly because you haven't heard from other people. You can't. You think you know everything, you don't. And that's a problem in the proud heart that refuses to listen and insists on speaking first. A real faith is shown in the heart that humbles themselves to listen.
quickly and to speak slowly. That's why the entire book of Proverbs is riddled with the exhortation to listen straight out of scripture, to listen, to hear, to be attentive, to let your heart hold fast my words. Do not forget. Do not turn away. Hear my son. Accept my words. Keep hold of my instruction. Incline your ear to my sayings. Ponder the path of your feet. Think. Stop. Listen. Hear. Ponder. You hear that all over the book of Proverbs. Proverbs. It's wisdom literature. It's God's book to us to show us what wise living looks like. And to be quick to listen is to be quick to listen. And to, to learn, excuse me, to grow and to avoid ignorance. So really practically, when you're in an argument with your spouse, what you need is understanding and insight into what the other person is feeling. You must listen. You must listen. When you feel betrayed by your best friend, you need understanding and insight into what really happened. That only comes from listening. You think you have it all figured out in your mind? You know how many times I've learned the hard lesson when I walk into a meeting of some kind or I'm sitting with someone of some kind, I think I've got the whole scenario in my mind, like I got it down pat, I know what I'm about to say, but if I would just listen, I would hear, and I got it all wrong. I got it all wrong. When you listen, you can see those things. When you're confused about something that's happening in your life, in your church, in your work, in your school, you need understanding, you need insight that comes from listening. That comes from gaining a wider perspective than only what's in here. It comes from listening. And when you're struggling during a tough season of your life, you need understanding, you need insight from the Lord. It comes from listening, listening to God's word. Listening to godly people. Listening to the Lord in prayer. Listening. And you know one of the most prevalent problems in relationships that break down is people just don't feel heard. They don't feel acknowledged. They don't feel valued. Listen, I can, I can tell you probably every time if there's a relationship breakdown, you, you don't understand. <clears throat> You're not listening to me. You don't hear what I'm saying. You think this, but it's really this. And I just want you to, to understand that it's this, not this. Every relationship, every communication breakdown, every marital breakdown. It, it's, the person needs to be heard, and the other person needs to be heard. But both just keep speaking at each other without listening. The relationship breaks down every time. Because people need to be acknowledged. They need to be heard. And the only way you can meet that person's needs adequately is if you would listen to what they're saying. And so James is giving us some wisdom here. And we need to be quick to listen and slow to speak. Conversely, one of the marks I've seen of a joy-filled, edifying relationship is this, whether it's a friendship or a parental-child relationship or a marital relationship, whatever it is, listen, this is one of the hallmarks of a strong relationship of any kind is that they listen to each other. They are quick to listen. They want to know what you have to say. They, they care about what you have to say. And they listen and they gather information and they don't dwell in the land of ignorance, but they are informed. They understand. They know how you feel. They can meet your needs. You can care for each other because, listen, good relationships are relationships where two people, three people, five people, they all listen to each other. They listen. God's word is amazing. He gives us a simple, basic, profound principle here. And we need to be quick to listen and slow to speak. Proverbs 17, 28 says this. Watch this. It says, whoever restrains his words has knowledge. You hear that? Not ignorance. Whoever restrains his words has knowledge. And he who has a cool spirit is a man of understanding. Now, this is funny. Even a fool who keeps silent is considered wise. Did you hear that? You could be the most foolish person on the planet. And, and God's word said, even a fool who keeps silent is wise. When he closes his lips, it says, he is deemed intelligent. Interesting. 
Don't say what's in your mind and no one will know how foolish you are. To stay silent, it's almost like there's wisdom in being quiet. Now we need to clarify a few things before we go on. We're talking a lot about listening first and speaking second, being quick to listen and slow to speak. I wanna just clarify for some of us, uh, I don't want anyone to walk away thinking the words of scripture here are addressing personality types of any kind, because how many know there are just some people that are wired, they talk more than others, right? It's just, and that's not bad, it's not bad at all. I'm not trying to be funny here. Some people are more talkative, some people are more outgoing. The scriptures are not condemning you saying, change your personality, don't talk. The scripture's not saying you need to stop, you know, being so outgoing. The scripture's not saying that at all. We're not talking about transforming talkative people into less talkative people at all. God has made everyone wonderfully and fearfully and beautifully. It's a beautiful thing. What we're talking about here is all believers, regardless of how God has designed us, exercising wisdom and humility through, listen, a disposition to yield and prefer others by being quick to listen and slow to speak. It's gotta be our disposition. It doesn't matter what your personality's like. It doesn't matter if you're the most talkative person in the room or you're the most quiet person in the room. Because the most quiet person in the room can have a heart problem. Where they, they may not be quick to speak outwardly, but in their heart, they're having dialogues in here. They're just going on. You think, oh, that person's wise, they don't talk much. Well, well, not necessarily. Maybe in their hearts, they've established all kinds of conclusions. They're not listening to anything. They're just talking up a storm within their own heart. So it's not about your personality. It's not about how God has made you. If you love to talk, keep talking. But have a disposition of humility to listen. If you're outgoing, be outgoing. We love that. But do it with a disposition to have a heart that yields to others and prefers others. And conversely, if you're quiet, don't think you're wise just because you're more quiet. Check your heart. Do you have dialogues in here? Do you have dialogues in here that show, if you're really honest with yourself, that I am actually not quick to listen, I am actually uh, quick to speak, because you're just talking up a storm in your heart? You may not see it outwardly, but it may be there. God is always going after the heart. And so speaking and acting with real wisdom means that we must be quick to listen and slow to speak. And if we are in fact quick to speak and slow to listen, it reveals pride in our lives and it reveals ignorance in our hearts, in our lives. And God is calling us to be people of wisdom. God is calling us to be people of great, remarkable a wisdom that evidences a real and sincere faith. Wisdom in the way that we speak and act. Wisdom when you're in your small group and someone wants to gossip. Wisdom when you're on the, at the bus stop and talking to your friend and, and they want to gossip to you. Wisdom, wisdom, wisdom. Wisdom when you feel like criticizing someone because of something you thought happened. Wisdom says, hold on, I'm not going to do that yet. I got to listen. I got to listen. I got to figure this thing out. I got to figure out what happened here. Wisdom, when you think you have the whole thing figured out, you humble yourself and you put your hand over your mouth. Quick to listen. I need to hear. I need to gather all the facts. I don't want to be ignorant. I don't want to be proud. God will be glorified in your life. God will be honored in your life. And your life will be spared a thousand follies and a thousand moments of foolishness and a thousand uh, difficult circumstances that will crush you. Your life will be spared if we can learn to live the way James is exhorting us to live. Quick to listen and slow to speak. Speaking and acting with real wisdom means that we must be quick to listen, slow to speak, and then finally write this down. Speaking and acting with real wisdom means that we must be, write this down, slow to anger. We must be slow to anger. Notice verse 19 again. It says, know this, my beloved brothers. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak. And here it is, slow to anger. Slow to anger. Now, no, doubt, no doubt some of us have ideas of what it means to be angry. Some of us have different ideas. You're developing something in your head right now of what it means to be angry. Anger is a common human emotion and there are very sinful ways of being angry, but you can be angry and not sin. 
That's why the Apostle Paul says in Ephesians 4.26, in your anger, do not sin. Because you can experience the emotion of anger without sinning, but if you're not careful, you won't get there. Okay? So there are two kinds of anger, a righteous anger and an unrighteous anger. But the anger that James has in mind here, listen, it's not explosive, hot-tempered, punch-a-hole-in-the-wall kind of anger. That's not what he's talking about. If you're picturing that, like you're picturing the guy James is talking to, be slow to anger. No, no, don't be just running wild and hot-tempered. That's not what he's talking about here. He's actually referring to something far more prevalent He's talking about the anger, which is a deep and quiet, bitter anger that smolders and simmers in an unnoticeable way. That's what the Greek word pictures for us. James is not talking about the guy that's running around punching holes in walls, screaming and yelling. He's not talking about that guy. He's talking about the guy who maybe there's many of us in this room that are like this. I'm like this often. We may not be screaming our heads off, But in our hearts, there's a quiet bitterness. There's a quiet fury. There's a quiet, unnoticeable resentfulness. That's what James is talking about and addressing here. So we'll pause here for a moment and examine our hearts. There are people in this room probably who aren't yellers. You don't throw things. Your facial expressions aren't always telling of what's in your heart, but deep within your heart, you are bitter and angry. Is that true? It's not for you to look at someone else or someone beside you. It's just for you to examine your own heart. You in this room today, and you're angry and bitter and resentful. Stop and think about it because the moment you stop and think, you may think to yourself, man, I didn't really see it. It may have gone unnoticed even to you. James is saying, hey, 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 slow, slow to anger. Slow to allowing this quiet bitterness and resentfulness to simmer simmer in your heart and to smolder in your heart. Slow to that kind of anger. Notice verse 19 and 20. He says, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. Watch this, verse 20. He says, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Very simply, it means this. Harboring bitterness and resentfulness in our hearts can never serve the purposes of God. You say, I'm not letting it out. It's okay. That quiet anger, in fact, that remains in your heart, it can never serve the purposes of God. The word righteousness here refers to that which is pleasing to God. To have an unnoticed anger in our hearts, this bitterness, this resentfulness, keeping it there, even though no one can see it and no one can notice it, it does not accomplish that which pleases God. That's what James is saying. He's saying, don't let yourself go there. Don't let yourself get there. If we're angry about something today, it's causing you to grow bitter and resentful and cynical, it's not a righteous anger. God does not want you to feel that. In fact, he calls you to repent of that and God wants to help you overcome that because he loves you. And he doesn't leave us without his provision. And so we're gonna end in a few moments. I want to end by just showing you two things from our context here. Two circumstances that tempt us towards an unrighteous anger. And maybe you land in one of these categories today. Together we want to choose a better way this morning. Together we want to choose a better way. Write this down. Today I choose to be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. Specifically, write this down. Specifically when I'm convicted by God's word. Convicted by God's word. Some commentators connect these verses with the next section that focuses on how we need to respond and obey the word of God. And so James may have had in mind here that people were revolting inwardly at a message that was preached or a passage of scripture that was read, something that came upon them and cut them and convicted them and and, and corrected them. And I love our church so much because you love God's word. You come here each week and you want to hear God's word. But the reality is that God's word sometimes has something cutting to say to us. Maybe for some it's happening this morning. 
Hebrews 4 verse 12 says, For the word of God is living and active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. God's word, loved ones, is sharp. And sometimes, sometimes, people get angry when God's word is extended towards them in a way that, that cuts to the heart. Because God's word will cut to the heart. And God's word will do some excavating. And God's word will do some pruning. And God's word will do some rebuking. And God's word will do some correcting. And I'm so thankful that it's a very rare occurrence in this church. Almost never that someone comes up to me upset because something was preached forcefully. But, but once in a blue moon, someone may say, Now, I don't like the way you came up in my business with that message today, Jason. I don't like the way you challenge the way that I'm living with the Word of God. I don't like the way you're correcting me with the Word of God. I don't like the, how that feels. It makes me uncomfortable, and some people get angry and bitter. That's happened before. I don't want to hear what God's Word has to say to me about this. I like living this way, and I want to keep living this way. I don't care what God's Word has to say. I'm going to keep doing it, and they get angry. God's word says repent. God's word says you need to be corrected. God's word says you need to be rebuked. You need to come off that path and come on this path. And sometimes that gets people angry. Amen. Listen, loved ones. If you're here in this room today, you've read something or you've heard something preached. I hope, I hope, loved ones, you know that I want to preach with humility and love for you. I hope that you know that I don't think I'm better than you. In fact, I apply these things to myself. I'm not trying to come on top of you, but I'm just trying to say to you, sometimes the word of God is cutting you can't be upset about that. You can't be upset about that. If God's word says something, we ought to submit our lives to it. And so when I'm convicted by God's word, I need to make a decision today that I'm going to be slow to anger. Would you make that decision today? Just right now? Would you make that decision? Sometimes God's word will say something that will flip your whole world upside down. Sometimes God's word will address something in your life. It'll flip your whole world upside down. But will you make a decision today? Will you make a commitment today? I will be slow to anger when I'm convicted by God's word. I want to submit myself to him and do what he says and there find freedom and joy. Because as long as we get angry with God's word and resist God's word, you will not experience the joy and freedom that he wants you to experience. So today I choose to be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger, specifically when I'm convicted by God's word. But secondly, write this down. Today I choose to be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. Write this down. When I'm offended by God's people. When I am offended by God's people. In chapter 4 of the book of James, he addresses fighting and quarreling among people in the church. We're going to get there. So he would have certainly had this in mind as he exhorts the readers to be quick to listen and slow to speak and slow to anger. There's really no better way to destroy a church and to hinder the work of God in a church. There's no better way than when you get offended to be quick to anger. There's no better way to destroy a church than by doing that. And what we need less of is people who are offended, getting all mad, being quick to speak, and slow to listen, and fighting with each other. James is going to talk about that. We don't need any of that here. What we need, what we need is people who are willing to make a decision today. I'm going to be quick to listen when you offend me, when someone offends me. I, I, I don't know everything. It hurts, it hurts. But I don't know everything. i got to listen. And, and I'm going to be slow to speak, and I'm going to be slow to anger. Because listen... You think the church is perfect? Does anyone in this room under the illusion that any church is perfect? Is anyone in this room under the illusion that there won't be other believers in Jesus Christ that won't accidentally or even intentionally hurt them? Does anyone think that? I don't. People hurt me all the time. And I hurt people. I don't want to. They don't want to. But it's the reality of life. But one thing I find that's so healing is when I'm offended or when someone's offended by me, if we embrace these things, if we are slow to speak, if we are quick to listen, if we are slow to anger, if the context is love, we'll get in a room with each other. We'll be listening to each other. And listen, you know how quickly that problem is solved? I'm, I'm not exaggerating. 
You know how quickly that problem is solved? But to the extent that there is a quickness to speak, to the extent that there is a quickness to be angry, it prolongs the healing process. It prolongs the unity being fulfilled. It prolongs it in that meeting, in that reconciliation process. It prolongs it. And in some cases, people refuse. They want to be angry. And the thing just gets so hard because they're offended. And James is saying to us here, when you are offended, even by God's people in the church, you got to be wise. you got to have wisdom. Don't just open your mouth and just start talking, 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 talking because you're offended. Don't just let this thing simmering in your heart, this anger simmering in your heart just explode out of you in your speaking. Don't do that. James is saying, if you really know Jesus, if your faith is real and sincere, then you got to show it when you're offended, when someone wants to fight with you, when someone wants to quarrel with you, when you're misunderstood, when there's been misinformation passed along. you got to be slow to speak and quick to listen and slow to anger. And when you're offended, listen, we want you to be heard. But if each of us do this, if each of us do this, you know what God will do? Unity in the church will grow. Because listen, as the church grows, there's more opportunities for this person in this corner, and this person in that corner, and that person in that corner, to get mad at this person, get bent out of shape with this person, and why are they doing that, and why are they doing this? James says, hold on, hold on, hold on. We're not going to do that here. That's what James says. We're not doing that here. That's not what we do here. Be wise. Slow to speak. Quick to listen. And slow to anger. Because the anger of man does not accomplish the righteousness of God. It does not. <coughs> so I'm just telling you, loved ones, church, I love you. We're about to celebrate three years as a church. God has been with us, and he will continue to be with us. But you need to hear me right now. We are not going to do these games in this church. Do you hear that? We're not playing these, he offended me, and I'm going to get angry, and I'm going to gossip about that. We're not going to do that here. We're not. Because we love each other. And we love Jesus. And if someone offends you, slow to anger. Slow to anger. Just as God is slow to anger. If God wasn't slow to anger, we'd be dead. He is slow and full of grace. And so in this church, we need to make a decision today as we approach our third year anniversary this month. I'm asking you to decide, every single one of you, if this is your church home, I'm asking you to decide right now. I will be quick to listen. And you say that right now in your heart. You decide that. I will be slow to speak. I will be slow to anger. I'm just making a decision right now. I will be slow to anger. I'm asking you to make a decision. I will abide in Jesus Christ each day to find power to live this way. You say, I can't do it. I can't do it. I'm just tempted so often. That's why we need to abide in Jesus Christ. James is not putting forward some works righteousness here like you got to do this on your own strength. James is showing us that real faith that understands the grace of God in our lives is dependent on the power of the Holy Spirit to cause us to live that way. The way that he's calling us to live. You think Jason can live that way? I'm telling you, I'm going to fall flat on my face every day. I need the power of the Holy Spirit. I need the word of God. I need my times in prayer to fill my mind and fill my heart and give me the power I need to when someone offends me, when someone slaps me in the face, when I'm pouring out into them and all they want to do is hate me to say, hey, 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 we're going to figure this out. I'm not mad at you. We're going to figure this out. I love you. Who can do that? Who? Only people that abide in Jesus Christ. Only people that display wisdom of real faith. I want this church to be not just full of people attending a service. I don't care about that. I want this church to be full of people who are wise. Who've heard the word of God today. They're taking it. You're going to make some corrections. You're going to make some apologies. You're going to make some... 
Next, do some business with God. You're going to repent. You're going to confess. You're going to put yourself under God's word right now. And you're going to be wise. And I'm going to be wise. God's going to help us to be wise. I'm going to make a decision today to abide in Jesus Christ. To find the power we need to live this way. And we're going to make a decision today to pray for this church. We're going to make a decision today to be a source of unity. And never a source of discord. Would you make that decision? Would you make that? I'm just asking you as your pastor who loves you. I'm asking you, would you make that decision? I decide to be a source of unity and not a source of discord in this church. And if I have an issue, if I have a problem, if someone offended me, I will find the clear path to the open door and I will go talk to them. And God has given us all that we need to make these things right and the step-by-step process of how to make these things right in his word. So today I choose, would you choose, to be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. When you're convicted by God's word and it hurts, or when you're offended by God's people and it hurts. Make that decision right now. You say, you don't understand, Jason. There's an unresolved thing I'm going through right now. It's, it's pretty complex. No, one thing I've learned is this. Listen, I haven't been around a long time. I've been around long enough to learn this. There is no obstacle insurmountable when people humble themselves. I always say that. Sometimes I'm in a room with people. I'm saying, listen, listen. If we go, go at this with humility, you're going to be fine. But if there's any pride right now, we're dead. There is no obstacle too insurmountable. There's no hardship. There's no offense too hard to get around. There's no uh, offense that cannot be forgiven if there is not humility, if, if there is humility there. And as we make a decision to be a source of unity and to be quick to listen and slow to speak, we're also making a decision to abide in Jesus Christ and to be used by him. Listen, the mission is fierce out there. Life is hard. So many of us going through different things. Opposition is intense and intensifying. And we have like zero seconds to waste fighting and bickering and let me be heard and you have to hear me first. Like we have zero seconds to waste on that. I don't even have a minute for that. We have zero seconds. So, so loved ones, it's decision time for all of us. Why don't you bow your heads right now? We're gonna make a decision. Worship team, come, you're gonna lead us in a song. But I don't want anyone to leave, but I don't want anyone to move. This is a crucial moment for us in our, in our church. God is working, God is saving people. People are moving from death to life. And we're going to make a decision right now. Lord Jesus Christ, help me. Help me. You just say this in your heart. Help me to be quick to listen and slow to speak and slow to anger. In fact, I'm going to invite you to stand right where you are, all over. Stand up. Stand up. We're going to do business with God. If you're in this room today and you have an issue with someone else, You've been offended. You just say to the Lord right now, I don't know how it's all going to unfold. I don't know how it's all going to work out. But I decide right now to be slow to speak, quick to listen, and slow to anger. If someone has hurt you, you don't really know how to approach it. I'm just telling you, quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. If you've heard something from God's word that has challenged you to change your way of living and you're angry about it, I challenge you to say, I will be slow to anger today. And I will submit to God's word. I will do what he says. And you will see God fight for you. You will see God work in your life. You will see God do for you what you cannot do for yourself. But no more games, loved ones. We're in a great season of fruitfulness. As I said, people are getting saved. 
more and more people coming to sit under the teaching of God's word. We have zero seconds to play games. Now is decision time for us in this church. Slow to speak, quick to listen, slow to anger. Oh, God, help us. And Lord, I pray right now in the name of Jesus that nothing would hinder your work happening in this church. I thank you for your word. I thank you for your protection. I thank you that you are with us. I thank you next week, people will be plunged under the water in the waters of baptism. I thank you that last weekend, people turned from sin towards Jesus Christ to be saved. And I thank you even in this service right now, one by one, one life at a time, we will choose wisdom. We will make a decision to be quick to listen and slow to speak and slow to anger because we want our lives to be used and to display the righteousness of God. So Lord, we need your strength right now. In this room, there are people who need your strength and we call on you, Lord. We are done with fake superficial Christianity and we are running towards you wanting to be real right now in Jesus name do it in our lives do it in our marriages do it with our children oh God be with our precious children protect them that they would learn these things and they would grow they would be saved one by one this lost and dying world all around us this city full of hundreds and thousands of people who don't know you send us to them Lord Send people who are quick to listen and slow to speak and slow to anger. And when they are offended by us, we love them all the more. Send us, Lord. Give us your strength. You are our strength. All these things we believe you're doing in our hearts, and you'll do it even more this day forward. And now, and now, we lift up our voices to you in worship. In Jesus' name we pray. If you agree, say amen.